Hi guys, JJJ Jojo Jack back with the history of distortion pedals. This is the second part about the classic distortion. If you miss it, the first part about the first, click here to see it before. If the 60s were the first golden era, from the mid-70s on, the guitar world began to know the other types of distortion. Arise overdrives and classic distortions. Although they are more or less contemporary, we'll leave the overdrive for the third part of the series and focus today on the classic distortion. The word distortion was part of a few pedals named in the 60s. The first, probably the 1966 Vox Distortion Booster. But it wasn't a distortion, it was a fuzz. And not exactly a pedal, it was more like a box with a manual switch. Some pedals had distortion in their names, mostly versions of Big Muff. But the first pedal to have distortion as the main name should have been the well-known 1974 MXR Distortion Plus. Yet the advertisement says until today that its extent goes from overdrive to fuzz. Sometime later, in 1978, the famous Proco Rat appears, although it was initially announced as a fuzz, but it was a distortion. Finally, also in 1978, appears the pedal that many consider as the standard classic distortion pedal. The extremely popular Boss DS-1 distortion. A decade later, in 1988, the Boss DS-2 turbo distortion tries to ride the fame of its older brother as an evolution of the DS-1. That same year, the Proco Rat 2 replaces the first, but with no major changes. And yet in 1988, another historical distortion pedal comes into play and deserves a mention here, the Governor from Marshall. This continued in 1991 and returning with a new face in 2000. The curiosity about distortion pedals is that they are a common target for mods, circuit modifications. The mods are changes to the original circuits of the pedals, some simple, some more complex, in order to change the sound, expand limits, or add some functionality. Why am I saying this now? Because although we have mods for almost any pedal, including not only distortions, the Boss DS-1 is one of the most modified pedals. One of the most famous modders is Robert Keeley. Some famous guitar players used the DS-1 modified by him, which ended up creating his own line of pedals. Brian Wampler is another well-known modder who also created his own line of pedals, including some very well-commented distortions such as Pinnacle Standard, trying to recreate the sound of Betty Van Halen and the versatile Sovereign Distortion, both released in the middle of the last decade. As you can see just by looking to these Wampler pedals, while the first seems to have remained a little more faithful to the origins, classic distortions suffered many evolutions gained new controls, changes in the sound. Going back to history, in the 80s, for example, started to appear a more specific type of distortion that some call metal or modern or high gain or extreme, which would be an extremely saturated distortion and, in some cases, more scooped in the middle frequencies widely used in death metal and other very heavy types of rock. Some examples. 
1983 Boss HM2 Heavy Metal, the 1991 MT2 Metal Zone, also from Boss, the 2003 MXR Dime Distortion, a project in which Dimebag Darrell himself would have participated, and the 2006 Electromonics Metal Muff. Another addition to the distortions was the feedback in some pedals like the 1984 Boss DF2 or the newer 2012 Fender Runaway, simulating that feedback whistle that happens usually at high volumes with the guitar near a saturated amplifier. Another common difference between the first and the classic distortion is the tone control. There are exceptions, but many fuzzes have no tone control, while the overwhelming majority of classic distortions have it. Which sometimes is not much more than a simple treble cut filter, but it's there. And except the big muff, all historical fuzzes I showed in the first video had no tone knob. But what really distinguishes a classic distortion from a fuzz? Are they that different? Electrical circuit apart, and speaking only in terms of sound, it depends heavily on the listener, who doesn't like or doesn't understand it. We'll say it's all the same, it's all noise, but if you are there, listening to me so far, probably doesn't think like that. Well. While the first sound came almost by accident, as we saw in the first part of the story, maybe even a little artificial and with aggressively clipped waves, classic distortion, even when it's very strong, tries to recreate a more natural distortion, such as that of a heavy and loud amplifier. And even though it is very saturated, it can sound less torn than a traditional fuzz. But again, this is only a definition in words of how I see the classic distortion. Better here an example, one of several possible examples of a typical classic distortion pedal sound. Well, I have chosen Jimi Hendrix as the fuzz icon in the first video. But who is the symbol of classic distortion? It's much more difficult. The most historical period of hard rock that I placed between 1969 and 1974, which means post-Woodstock and pre-punk, where we have Led Zeppelin, the Purple, Black Sabbath, the hard rock dinosaurs at their best. It could have been the ideal time to pick up an icon for the classic distortion pedal, but these pedals didn't exist, so or they used first pedals or saturated amplifiers. In fact, think of it, the sound of these guys is what must have inspired the creation of the classic distortion, and not vice versa. 
proof of that is today we have pedals that try to recreate the sound of some amplifiers that these people use. As the acclaimed Sam Zamp from Tech 21, which began the saga in 1989, or the 2007 Boss FBM-1 that simulates the Fender Bassman. But from the end of the 70s onwards, virtually every rock guitar player at some point ended up using some classic distortion pedal. Joe Perry, Randy Rhodes, Kurt Cobain, Slash, Joe Satriani, Steve Vay, me. So it's complicated to choose one as an icon. Well, enough for today, guys. In the next chapter, the overdrive. See ya!